This is 7 News, the voice of the border. Tonight, tyres slash in an overnight attack at Albury train station. Australia Day plans forge ahead, that's despite no community consultation. And a multi-million dollar boost securing Wodonga's wastewater for decades to come. 7 News begins now. Good evening. Albury train station staff and commuters are in shock after an unknown offender slashed tyres at the station overnight. It's understood this is a recurring problem and police are investigating. Jackie Stanley is at the station for us now. And Jackie, how many people were affected? Maddie, we have four cars behind me that were targeted in this incident, but there are unconfirmed reports of up to 30 cars targeted in this stunt. One of the victims is an employee at the station. She has a spare tyre, but couldn't change it over because the spare already had been damaged by a pothole, a devastating blow to the hip pocket before Christmas. Police were on the scene this morning gathering evidence, and it's unclear whether one or multiple perpetrators are responsible. Anyone who witnessed this, Maddie, is urged to contact police. Thanks for the update, Jackie. That's Jacqueline Stanley reporting there for us tonight. Albury City Council will forge ahead with proposed changes to Australia Day activities. Council says there will be community engagement for future celebrations, but for now, it's left a sour taste for some. It's a controversial decision that was last night reaffirmed by Albury City Council. Australia Day activities will change course in 2024. Councillors did feel that um, they were showing leadership in reaffirming this decision. The Albury Awards will be held on January 19th. On Australia Day, the Norial Park Foreshore will host a family fun day and the citizenship ceremony will be held on January 29th. Acknowledging that the Albury Awards are so significant that we really wanted a standalone event and, and also reaffirming that um, Australia Day, the public holiday, um, there will still be activities uh, down at Norial Park. It was these proposed changes to Australia Day activities that were made without community consultation, creating an outcry of public backlash. That's certainly been acknowledged and received. Uh, there was an opportunity during debate last night to, um, to defer and, and maybe consider seeking consultation, but that wasn't the majority rule. More than 2,000 outraged residents have signed a petition started by MP Susan Lee in previous weeks. To make the decision by stealth and then to have, it would seem, a tin ear to the community that has stepped up and actually said, we don't like this and we'd like it reversed. I would say simply, please consult the community. The well-supported petition was presented to council before their meeting last night. I would urge all residents of Albury, if and when they get a chance to be consulted, to make their point very clearly. Aubrey's Mayor says Council will seek community feedback after these events and their input on the ceremonies for 2025. We'll certainly have uh, lots of team members seeking feedback on their thoughts, on what they thought and, and whether there were some hits or misses or, or what we can do going forward. Rochelle Podigovic, 7 News. Beeline services will come to a grinding halt with thousands of workers walking off the job tomorrow morning. It comes after months of lobbying for fairer working and pay conditions were dismissed by the network. Phoebe Worthley joins us now. And Phoebe, what does this mean for commuters? Well, Maddie, tomorrow's strikes will certainly be felt here on the border with only three trains operating to and from Melbourne as is. From 3 o'clock tomorrow morning, conductors, controllers, station staff and customer workers have confirmed they'll be stepping off the job for five hours until 8 tomorrow morning, with delays and cancellations set to last throughout the day. The Rail and Bus Union has been pushing for six months for better work and wage security and a 36-hour working week for its staff. The union says the conditions address the same concerns as their Metro counterpart, saying it's about more than just a pay rise. This fight is about making sure that we secure the rail jobs for the future. Ticketless technology coming to Victoria poses a serious risk to the frontline jobs and we want to safeguard those jobs. Now, V-Line is urging commuters avoid taking the train entirely tomorrow and prepare and plan ahead of those delays. Maddie. Thanks for the update, Phoebe. That's Phoebe Worthley reporting there for us tonight. 
The board has set the agenda for years to come at the Albury Wodonga Health Annual General Meeting. And while executives remain positive about the future, other leaders have labelled the AGM disingenuous. A hospital for 300,000 people a year said to be the one that would lay the foundation for everything to come and a community ready to scrutinise. To try and get our questions answered. I'm oh, looking forward to hearing from the board today. We put a lot of questions to them. Oh, I'm really interested in the outcome of this discussion about the hospital and where it goes. So the annual general meeting's on today and I'm very keen to hear what people have got to say. CEO Bill Appleby kicked off the meeting, addressing the political, economic and social challenges the Public Health Service has come up against. Today, the CEO remains positive and proud of the hospital's achievements. January's colonoscopy recall saw the hospital manage almost 2,000 patients who'd undergone potentially incomplete procedures. And a new program was adopted to decrease the amount of babies born preterm. I think the work that we're doing is absolutely outstanding with uh, 70 other hospitals across the country. The board touted its new strategic plan, six major priorities to take the hospital into the future. We think it will be really transform, uh, transformative for the organisation. Um, so a really exciting time for us uh, as a board to really lay down the, uh, the, the foundation for the next it's a, it's a legacy plan, so we're hoping that it will set us up for the next 30 to 40 years. Among the in-person attendees were a handful of security guards. And despite being a public health service, news cameras weren't allowed in the building, prompting questions to the Victorian government and CEO that couldn't be answered. Uh, no idea, sorry. Open and transparent, yet cameras weren't allowed in from the media into the, into the room when the meeting was being held. Um, I find that as totally disingenuous. It's contradictory, in fact. Jacqueline Stanley, 7 News. Wodonga Council has re-elected Mayor Ron Mildren for a second term. Council has secured his position in three to, to four votes at last night's meeting, narrowly overcoming his challenger, Danny Lowe. Danny Chamberlain was voted in as Deputy Mayor. Mr Mildred appreciates the support of the Wodonga community and anticipates a busy 12 months ahead to deal with the advocacy for the hospital and that's starting to escalate and ramp up and there's a lot of work to do there. We're also going to try and continue to pursue the economic development um, initiatives that we started over the last 12 months. The next elections are due to be held in October 2024. The Shadow Minister for Water has begun a tour downstream amid swelling concerns over the Murray-Darling Basin plan. The buyback fight back will consult farmers and riverside communities with hopes the federal government will reconsider its decision. The calm before the Murray swells to a storm. Last week, the government passed a new legislation to pump hundreds of gigalitres downstream. And it's turned riverside farmers furious. These politicians ought to write to me and tell me how houses grow food because we're not going to be able to do it. After last week's change to the Murray-Darling Basin plan, the government can buy back 450 gigalitres of water. That's to be put back into the environment, meaning scarcer water, which some say will deepen inflation. Bonagilla farmer Lindsay Rapsey has already lost access to 60% of his water over the last two years. He fears business will come to a drip if the government takes more. Our production is very intense and it, if it keeps going the way it is, it will fall by 50%. Mr Rapsey says restoring the environment is at the key of the program, but that he's yet to see. The, there is no environment now, it's gone, because they've got the water flowing too fast. Um, in our day, you would see 20 to 30 platypus a day. Now I see one platypus every three months. The Shadow Minister for Water says his greatest concern is its flow and effect on the local economy. Every 100 gigalitres that leaves our region, there's five to 600 jobs we lose. And that's not just in the farming sector, that's in the, uh, the, the production and the further add-on and the value add that goes to our communities. So with the Nationals deputy leader in tow, Tim McCurdy has kicked off the buyback fight back tour. Travelling downstream from Albury to Mildura, speaking with locals about their concerns on the new look plan. 
collecting those stories so that we can share them and people can hear exactly what the impacts will be of further water buybacks from Victoria's system because it will be catastrophic. Federal MP Susan Lee has slammed the government for its oversight on our region and farmers. She's calling for the government to reverse its decision as the threat of another El Nino event looms. When we're in a dry time, it becomes even harder for our farmers. It becomes even harder for those to manage on less water. So just imagine if 20% of that water has been taken away from your region. That makes it even worse and even harder and makes this decision even more appalling. Phoebe Worthley, 7 News. North East Water has announced a new way to treat the region's wastewater to the tune of $73 million. It will adopt a circular economy to cut back on wasted resources and put energy back into the electrical grid. It's a stinky business, but someone's got to do it. Wastewater treatment plant is ultimately where when we flush things down the toilet or goes down the drain, that's where it ends up. And as Wodonga will double in size in the coming decades, more and more wastewater will wash along the drains, ending up here. The Border City's treatment plant will soon be overflowing, but a $73 million investment is now locked in. Using state-of-the-art technology, Northeast Water will build two new lagoons, separate the industrial wastewater from the domestic waste and power the plant with the adjoining 3-megawatt solar farm. With this plant, we will produce biogas, which is predominantly methane, and from that biogas, we can then utilise that to produce electricity. Ultimately, reducing carbon emissions by more than 50% and hiring 50 local tradesmen to pull it off. Towards the end of 2025, early 2026 is when we'd expect the project to be completed. The project plans to take excess oxygen from the hydrogen plant. And use that oxygen to uh, aerate the, um, the sewerage to, to break it down effectively and efficiently. Creating a circular economy of renewables in one hub. Northeast Water says the hope is that the upgrade will keep bills as low as possible. A remarkable investment for generations to come. Jacqueline Stanley, 7 News. Well, Kirsty joins us now with a look at today's weather. And Kirsty, it was a bit of a breezy day today ahead of some storms. That's right, Maddie and Nick. Good evening to you both and hello, everyone. Certainly a windy day for parts of the region, particularly in our western parts about Yarrawonga in the north. Scattered cloud too, those overnight minimums sitting in the high teens and in the low 20s. Our skies cleared to a little more sunshine about mid-morning. The hot maximum temperatures continuing as we continue to feel heatwave-like conditions in Mer Myrtleford, 35 degrees was our top. Even in Mount Buller to the south, we had that top of 23. We did see storms develop late this afternoon over parts of the high country, though. Around Dinner Plain, we've seen thunder and lightning that moved through at around half past four. There is the risk of severe thunderstorms developing into tomorrow as well. I'll have a look at our midweek weather forecast after sport, guys. OK, sounds good. Thanks, Kirsty. We'll see you soon. Still to come in seven years, a green light granted for a new servo in Wodonga's growth corridor. And a generous appeal spread some Christmas cheer to the border's most vulnerable. Welcome back. The green light has now been granted for a new service station to be built in Barranduda. Wodonga Council last night voted 5-2 in favour of the development, which will see the BP built on the corner of Glenwood and Barranduda Boulevard. 38 objections were submitted to Council against the proposal, but the need for the facility in Wodonga's biggest growth corridor overruled those concerns. Two local organisations have teamed up spreading Christmas cheer among the border's most vulnerable this festive season. In their seventh year, Uniting and the SSNA Club have decorated a giving tree with room for donated gifts. The Christmas campaign is supporting vulnerable children and teenagers, aiming to give the gift of hope to families across the region. Their faces of pure relief means that their children are going to wake up with the present under the tree where previously they might not have been able to do that. Donations can be placed under the giving tree until Thursday. Well, up next in 7 News, a look ahead to one of the border's biggest cricket events. And Lauren Jackson set to don the green and gold in what could be her fifth Olympic campaign. 
Welcome back. Lauren Jackson's time in Australian colours might not be over just yet. The 42-year-old has been selected in an extended 20-player Opal squad to contest February's Olympic qualifiers in Brazil. Jackson's selection is subject to her fitness. However, if she does make the final team for Paris, it'll be her fifth Olympic campaign. Jackson recently also committed to a local side, the Albury Wodonga Bandits, for the upcoming season. Well, cricket now heads into its final weekend before the Christmas break, but not before the big show. Lavington Sports Ground is just days away from hosting the biggest sporting event held there this year. A 12-team competition with many thinking only five could win the grand final. However, the first half of the season has delivered plenty, with almost every team remaining a genuine premiership hope. Everyone was saying there's only four or five sides and these sides won't be here and these sides won't be there and you pick who's going to be at the bottom and top and all of a sudden you look at you know sides, the big powerhouses like Wodonga, North Albury, Lavington, St Pat's over the last four or five years. Well, they're not sitting one, two, three and four. They're sitting anywhere from third down to... 12. But the highlight of the season so far will come on December 23rd when Sydney Thunder and Melbourne Stars battle at Lavington Sports Ground. The Big Bash is Australia's professional T20 competition, attracting some of the world's best and an anticipated crowd of 10,000. It's just enormous. It's just fantastic. Both councils have worked together to make this happen. And we're just there in the background ticking along, making sure all the boxes are covered. Locally, Cricket Albury Wodonga will add their T20 tournament in the new year. Matches are set to be played midweek from January with two divisions, including a district and Hume combined comp. Tuesday nights from about the 9th of January onwards, all the way through till the end of February. Uh, the knockout comps will start the following Sunday, which is about, I'm going to go with the 14th, either the 14th or 21st, and that'll be 32, 16, 16, 8, 8. Four, four into two. And any debate about changing the finals top six format has been put to bed by the chairman. Currently, every side faces elimination from week one, with some wanting a bigger advantage for the number one ranked side. Not as long as I'm chairman, no. Stephen Murphy, 7 News. Well, despite Patrick Harrington not playing over the weekend, he still leads cricket's run scoring. Harrington has 388 runs just in front of East Albury's Matt Tom, who also didn't play. Luke Rafferty tops the district runs ladder with Bethanga's Jack Bridgman joining Ryan Barker as the leading wicket takers. And in Hume, just one run sits between the top two with Waller dominating the bowling attack this summer. Searing temperatures force the weekend softball Albury Wodonga action to be cancelled, but it hasn't stopped a hot competition, with the season evenly poised heading into the Christmas break. At the start of the season, perennial powerhouse Comets left the competition to pursue an opportunity in Wagga. It formed part of a decision for the league to combine both A and B grade with immediate success. The feedback's been fantastic about it. I think it's brought the association together a little bit more than it had. So far, seems like it's a fairly even comp heading into the Christmas break. It's the only downside so far has been a, a lack of umpires with four senior games happening at once. So if there's anyone out there that can umpire that hasn't been doing anything on Saturday Arvo, come on down after Christmas. With just two games separating third from eighth and every team suffering a loss, the season looks very much even. I think top of the table, Bundy have had a really good first half of the year and they'll be hard to beat from here. But uh, yeah, look, on their day, I think just about any team, you know, all the way down to Wangaratta who are brand new in the comp. They've won a few games, uh, had a draw pretty recently as well. So yeah, on the day, any team can win it. Perhaps the biggest success, though, has been Wangaratta's return after two decades out of the game. I think if I was them, I'd be extremely happy. They only have a couple of people with some experience. Um, their new ones are coming along really well, and there's also a couple of young girls in that team that are just starting to feel very comfortable and make a mark on the competition. Under the league's heat policy, all matches were called off in round nine. Players now with plenty of time to enjoy festive activities, with matches not due to resume until February 3. Just a whole range of factors. We've tried time and time again to do it earlier. There's heat comes into it, families being away, and just a break. It's nice. People play sport all year round. Nice little break in January just gives time with their families and a nice break. Stephen Murphy, 7 News. Up next in 7 News, Kirsty is back and she's got an in-depth look at what's happening weather-wise over the next few days. That's next.
Good evening, everyone. A low-pressure system circulating around the Bight in South Australia is linking with a trough through parts of Victoria. Together, these systems bringing hot and humid air into the state with those north-northeasterly winds and with that risk of storm activity set to increase over the next 24 to 48 hours. There is the risk those storms could also become severe. A new high-pressure system is then likely to return our state to more dry and settled weather through the second half of our week. The rain map does look relatively dry over the northeast, but that risk of severe storms could bring heavy rainfall. It is the south of the state towards Melbourne at this stage that looks to receive some heavier showers. On to our temperatures for the middle of our working week and our maximums are set to soar again tomorrow, reaching the high 30s right across the border region. But also we are expecting those possibly severe storms. They could bring the potential for damaging winds, heavy localised rainfall and hail, most likely late tomorrow. Winds are already forecast to be strong at around 30 kilometres an hour, 35 in Beechworth and 31 for Omeo. Those temperatures dropping by about 5 degrees as we head into Thursday. Albury Wodonga returning to tops of 31 under mostly sunny skies, although a slight shower sticking around the likes of Coryong and then again towards the high country. That windy weather also persisting northwesterlies at around 30 kilometres an hour. Falls Creek could see about a 50% chance of a millimetre of rain and a top of 17. More calm and settled weather on the way for Friday though as that trough begins to shift away from the region. A clear and sunny day, those temperatures cooling off slightly, Benalla back to 28 as we feel a bit of a west southwesterly wind change moving into our region. Looking ahead now, our weekend looking beautiful, blue skies, not quite as hot. That intense heat does look to return early next week. We're keeping an eye on those severe thunderstorms potentially developing tomorrow before a slight cool change coming through. That's it, quite a big drop on Thursday, yeah. Kirsty. It'll be a bit nicer, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now for a quick look at fuel prices, and you can find unleaded for a dollar seventy nine and diesel for a dollar ninety eight at Mobile in Albury. In Wodonga, Seven Eleven has unleaded for a dollar eighty three and diesel for one ninety eight. Unleaded is one dollar and eighty three cents at Ampole in Howlong, and diesel is two dollars and six cents at Mobile in Corowa. And that's your local news for tonight. Thanks for watching. You can catch up on our website, or of course, at Seven Plus. Seven News from Melbourne is next. Enjoy your night, and we'll see you tomorrow.